Now that we've looked at the materials that pose an entanglement hazard and some of the tools you can use, the first step in dealing with an entanglement situation is recognizing and identifying the areas of your personal protective equipment that present an entanglement hazard. The first piece of equipment I want to look at is a helmet. Now whether you wear a retro style, traditional, or even a European, you need to be aware of the areas of that helmet that could pose you a problem. That first area is your face and eye protection. Now in retro style, typically that's going to be the brackets, the side brackets for the face shield itself. Traditional helmets can have that same face shield or they may have the older style pork flip downs or the newer style NFPA approved goggles. All three of these types of eye protection can pose an entanglement hazard. One thing that's unique to the traditional helmet over the retro style is the bracket for your company ID shield. One of the things that can happen is that a wire can be drawn to the point of that bracket or the beak of the eagle and can fall behind the shield. Very difficult to get yourself free without cutting. The last area of your helmet is any accessories that you're carrying on your lid. Any lumber or wedges, uh, any lights, especially the ones that are on a fixed bracket. The next piece of equipment we're going to look at is our breathing apparatus. Now just like the helmet, it doesn't matter what make or model you use, you just need to be thoroughly familiar with it in all the areas that could pose you a potential problem. On both my departments, we use MSA. Now it's a great pack, but MSA does have a lot of features and components that can pose us a problem in an entanglement situation. So let's take a look at them. The first area of concern is the face piece. We have our mass mounted regulator, the bypass valve, on the MSA you can have your electronic speech projection on the left and your heads up display on the right, all entanglement hazards. Looking at the harness assembly, one of the problem areas on the MSA is the top of the air cylinder between the cylinder and the back plate. One thing that can happen if you're not careful is that a wire can be drawn between these two areas and as you move forward you can pull that wire in between the air cylinder and the back plate. Extremely difficult to get out of and one of the reasons we never try to force our way out of an entanglement. Another area of concern on the harness is the middle. On the left, on the MSA, we have our first stage regulator. On the right, we have our cylinder band locking assembly. Now, it's the design and configuration of this assembly that makes it a significant hazard. It has two modes of operation. It flips up and then it also rotates. This design presents a significant hazard in itself, but as it does rotate, it further loosens up the cylinder, making it easier for a wire to be drawn between the cylinder and the harness backplate. We also have the base of the air cylinder, the cylinder valve, your gauges, your high pressure connection. On the MSA, you have the low air alarm or the bell. And then on newer SCBA, you have the rit fitting also referred to as universal air connection or the universal rig connection. Basically, it's your quick fill transfill valve. It's not only the intricacy, but also the location and the presentation of these components that present a significant hazard. Looking at the front of our harness, we have our shoulder straps, our waist strap and buckles. You have your gauges. On the MSA, you have your mass mounted regulator hose connection to your extend air. All of these areas are further entanglement hazards. Bottom line is you need to be familiar with your own SCBA and all the components that present a potential hazard. Beyond our helmet and our breathing apparatus, any tools that you're carrying. Also take a look at your gear itself. You carry a portable radio on the outside of your coat, any flashlights, you carry an escape or utility belt or even a seat harness and any accessories that you have attached to that seat harness or belt. The point to all this is that the more you are aware of all the areas of your personal protective equipment that present an entanglement hazard, the more likely you can avoid getting into trouble because you can shield, protect, or minimize the exposure of those components when you are confronted with an entanglement situation or a debris field. 
also, the more quickly you can get out of it, a situation because you'll know what areas to address, what areas are potentially getting hung up or that are caught on wires or debris. And you can go to those areas much more quickly and efficiently. A few final points that I want to mention. Understand that an entanglement situation falls within one of the Mayday parameters. So don't delay and call for help early. Remember, you can always cancel Mayday if you're able to get yourself out. But any delay in the beginning could cost you big time in the end. Also, if you're the operations chief or rapid intervention team managing the Mayday, we need to address utilities. Think about it. If that firefighter is caught in a collapse or debris field and is faced with open contacts or live energized wires that they're forced to cut through, they're going to be in a world of hurt. So we need to shut down gas and de-energize the building ASAP. The earlier in the incident, the better. It all starts with awareness. That leads to prevention. But we can't neglect training to develop a skill that allows us to react in a safe, quick, and efficient manner.